The views expressed on this program are solely those of the speakers and not those of any media outlets, businesses, companies, or other individuals. Hello, we would like to welcome you to this special program. It's four guys, four different backgrounds, four differing viewpoints. We have more than 200 plus years of collective experiences, conflicting perspectives, and admitted biases. We are sharing our opinions about news issues of the day, universal themes of the human condition, and sensitive subjects that too often are ignored, whispered about, or hotly debated. For example, the subtle complexities of race relations, contentious social movements, divisive politics, and yes, region stories that reflect national topics. This is not just another round table discussion or community forum or corporate initiative. It's a civil yet candid conversation for a hot 30 minutes. I'm Chuck Hughes, President, CEO of the Gary Chamber of Commerce. I'm Vernon Williams, columnist for the Chicago and Gary Crusader newspaper. I'm Jerry Davich, columnist with Post Tribune newspaper and Chicago Tribune Media. I'm Mark Chase, executive editor of the Times of Northwest Indiana and Midwest regional editor for Lee Enterprises. We welcome your opinions, your experiences, your viewpoint. Okay, guys, let's hit it. I will hurl the opening salvo. Race relations in this country are horrific. Feel free to dive in. <laughs> well, Chuck, I are race relations that... more horrific than they were in the past? I uh, know, I my... know uh, they've been they've been systematic. <laughs> but go ahead, Vernon. <laughs> no, I, actually, I was going to say something very similar. That um, it's not a new phenomenon. Uh, there's new focus on it because of recent events, uh, but the phenomenon goes back to the beginning. Uh, you can go back to 1619, um, but especially since the uh, in, in the 20th century and, and throughout the entire 20th century and the civil rights movement, some of the same issues, it almost sounds like a broken record. Some of the same issues that we're talking about today were talked about in the 50s, the 60s, the 70s. So it's ongoing. Right now, it may be more intensified than it's been in a minute. Jerry? Vernon, is it more verbalized or we just, is it more open instead of whispering it, we're talking about it or are we still talking it to the side too much? I think we're talking about it more because media is more pervasive in our lives. Uh, you got social media, you got the networks harping on it. You got print media doing so many stories about it that weren't done before. And of course, uh, the events of 2020 shoved it into center stage, um, ready or not, uh, with all of the social unrest. Never before in any of our lifetimes have all 50 states had movements that were in uh, lockstep with each other, as well as 300 countries around the world. That's incredible. Well, you said media, Vernon. That's a segue to our friend Mark. Mark, are you a media mogul? <clears throat> well, race relations have never been where they need to be in this country, uh, issues of equality, other, other things. We all know that we've never gotten where we need to be as the promise of this nation's doctrine would lead us to believe it should be in the United States of America. But it, it certainly doesn't help uh, when you have leaders uh, who have all sorts of toxic salvos that they send out on a regular basis and reignite uh, wounds or, or undo progress that's been made. I mean, uh, I think as a, as a country, we have made quite a bit of progress in this area. There are wins. There are things that uh, people have fought hard for and come out on the other side with the uh, social justices, the civil rights movement, uh, going all the way back to the Civil War even. There, there are big victories that this nation, unfortunately, uh, had to win from very, very bloody and uh, costly fights. Um, and so to see people uh, on a leadership stage, on a national stage, that try to undo that uh, with, with toxicity, uh, it's, it's really disheartening. Well, you know, when you talk about leaders, uh, it starts at the top, unfortunately, because uh, when we look at the fact that uh, the incident in Charlottesville, when there were good people on both sides, and 
the, the, the last three FBI directors suggested that white supremacy was the biggest threat to national security. The last three FBI directors. And then when you get members of Congress, 147 of them voted to not uh, uh, acknowledge uh, President Biden's victory. And the, the, the cities that were targeted were predominantly areas of African-American voters in Atlanta and, and places like that. And so uh, to your point, Mark and guys, it's, it's been pretty systematic. And when it starts at the top, then uh, we, we understand now how formidable the, the charge is going to be to try to uh, make things better. Well, Chuck, the, the flames have been fanned from the threat that's within, uh, and somebody has been fl uh, fanning the flames of the threat that's within. And it's interesting you mentioned that because if you, if you go back, uh, when I was in grad school, uh, I graduated with a master's degree in public affairs reporting years ago, uh, 2000, oh gosh, what was it? Uh, actually, it was 1998 uh, that I finished that degree. I did my master's thesis on media coverage of white supremacy and extremist organizations. Uh, when do you spotlight them? When is giving them a platform too much, even if you're covering the negative things that they're doing or the marches they're doing, when is that too much? Um, and should we be spotlighting these folks and pointing out what's going on with them rather than ignoring them? Because when you shine the spotlight on things, obviously in, in, in a lot of circles that people believe that that's going to, going to cleanse things and, and make us better for it. Um, back then I was taking a course called American Terrorism and it was at the University of Illinois at Springfield and they were talking about all of these threats from within that were, were coming about. And this is of course, just after the Timothy McVeigh thing, the bombing in Oklahoma City. You know, those are some very scary prospects that we've dealt with before, uh, but now it seems like it, it went away for a while, it ruminated for a while, now it's back, it's back in full force again. And, I think it's I think it's really scary, and I think it's really scary when you have to start thinking about the uh, the threats that exist on a domestic side being more dangerous than some of the things that we saw with 9/11. Hey Vern, what is the symbolism, Vern, of uh, Nazi symbols in the Capitol, Confederate flags, and and, and those kinds of things? I mean, uh, you talk about going all the way back to 1619 and slavery and, and, and some of the civil rights abuses that occurred in the 50s and 60s. But Vernon, when you see a visual like that, what does that suggest to you? Well, of course, it suggests some of the worst forms of hatred that America has ever known. Uh, it suggests some of the most contemptuous attitudes in terms of race in America. But we have to also, it's very important to look at the fact that the subtle racism is just as injurious. You know, when you have, for example, going into a store, Chuck, as I know has happened to you, mm -hmm. and having the security guard automatically think that he needs to pay special attention to you, or just driving down the street and having a police squad car pull slowly in back of you and turn right when you turn right and turn left when you turn left and sometimes stop you over nothing. I mean, it, it, it never has gone away. Um, I think there's been progress, but I think that along with those kinds of outward signs that are kind of in your face, the subtleties of racism and bigotry are the things that gnaw at the nerve of those people who want justice. Bernard, the instance that I shared with you uh, was uh, my late brother who lost his life in service of our country uh, he and I, uh, on one of his leaves, wanted to go to a place where we could talk, and not in Gary, because I was a councilman at the time, and I knew everybody, so we know we could not have an unabated conversation. So we went to uh, a club in one of our neighboring communities, and uh, it was not an, an African-American club. I was stopped at the door. Uh, the manager and the security guard stopped me and said, you can't come in. I said, well, why is that? You've been drinking. Vernon, the strongest thing that you know I drink is Diet Coke. <laughs> and so I'm like, what? And so I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm getting kind of, wait a minute, what are you talking about? Blah, 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 this or that and whatever. Little, long story short, they didn't let me in. So I called the Indiana Civil Rights Commission. And so they wanted to investigate 
But in the report, it asked, had I become belligerent? Uh, yeah, to some extent. <laughs> and so yeah. that kind of killed the case, but that's just another example of the kind of subtle racism that you talked about. Now, Jerry, I wanted to ask you a question because uh, I've certainly followed your commentary because that's what we do when we were in the business. And uh, you've had some pretty bold commentary being a white guy. And so what do you think from your perspective? Uh, how do you feel about that? And do, what, what sense of responsibility might you feel or not? Well, my initial sense of responsibility is ignorance because I cannot relate to Vernon's experience and your experience. That's never happened to me. Mark, I'm guessing it's probably never happened to you. It has as a journalist. I've been identified as a journalist and been treated as such, but never color of my skin. I think today's political climate, and you guys are all referring to Donald Trump, so I'll just say the two words, Donald Trump, <laughs> he revealed a lot of this uh, to, the, to the climate of our country. Now, I think it's all been there at a slow simmer obviously for decades and centuries, but it got turned up to a boil in 2020 and it spilled over, slapped on our face, made a mess of all of us. And now we're trying to wipe it off and address it. I think the interesting thing is that everything that Donald Trump or anybody, some of his followers who believe anything at all involving racism, I think it's just revealed an underbelly of our country. It hasn't made anything. It just showed us kind of who we are, what we have to deal with. So although it's a big negative, one of my first columns I wrote after Trump got elected into office is let's use this as a positive. He's going to bring up all this stuff, almost single-handedly to many degrees. Let's address it. Let's talk about it. That's how we got this discussion going today. We could talk about race relations, Chuck, for the next six hours. That's, you know, that's just a fact of life. So at least we're talking about it. There's this element in society we have to deal with. We know about that. And me as a white guy, I mean, I do have those built-in white privileges that uh, either I didn't understand when I was younger I certainly understand now, and I've never had the experience that you had, Vernon, and that you had, Chuck. Just in those two instances, never had them once in my life. Hey, Mark. Uh, now, you talked about, Mark, that uh, how we maybe should not highlight some of these folks or whatever, give them life. But when you look at people who are in Congress, like the Marjorie Taylor Greens and the Lauren Boebert, folks like that, who who uh, QAnon conspirators and, 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 and uh, weapon-toting uh, elected officials, uh, how do you balance that, Mark, uh, in terms of covering it, but not giving them uh, life, uh, 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 making, making uh, matinee idols out of, out of Chuck, I have to say that finishing the statements from earlier, I, my thesis didn't come down on the side of, of not covering. Uh, my thesis came down on the side of shining a spotlight on, uh, because the more we know about who they are, what they're doing, and what they're up to, I think the better it is for, for everybody out there. I, example of that is uh, a gentleman by the name of, and I use gentleman loosely, uh, by the name of Matt Hale, uh, who was a law student at Southern Illinois University in Carbondale when I was an undergrad down there. My alma mater too, but go ahead. <laughs> yep. we, we're both Salukis, Chuck. Um, when I was the, running the Daily Egyptian, the, the Daily Student newspaper down there as the editor, uh, there was a guy named Matt Hale who was part of the Southern Illinois University Law School. Uh, he was also the worldwide, quote unquote, leader of a group called the World Church of the Creator, uh, which is a white supremacy and extremist organization. Uh, there's a, a guy named Ben Claussen that wrote a book called The White Man's Bible. Uh, and it's, it's filled with all sorts of racist, racist diatribe. And they were, they were very much into uh, whites as a superior race and all of the things that you hear from the Aryan side of, of, of these extreme groups. Uh, I, uh, I actually did an um, investigation on Mr. Hale and his group, and we published it on the front page of the Daily Egyptian back then, just to let folks know, hey, yeah, this guy is here. Uh, he's, he's done some high-profile things in the places he's been. You may not know about him. This is who he is. This is what his beliefs are. He's traveling among you. He's here. And here's a detail of all the things they've done. And there were, there were uh, details in there about uh, hits that they'd put out on people and assassination attempts. Uh, Medgar Evers, uh, part of the, some, some people from the World Church of the Creator were behind that situation. Um, so, you know, I, again, I, I come down on shining a spotlight and making sure that people know who these folks are. And yeah, when, when people in Congress uh, uh, step out of line and do some of the things that have been done, uh, the, the spotlight should be white and very hot on what they've done. Mark, my experience in Little Egypt, as we call that area, of Southern Illinois. My first year there, my roommate, 
was a guy named Dale Ray. I use Dale's name. He was from Cicero, Illinois. The first two or three weeks there, Dale did not speak to me. He was like, must have been shocked as to who they randomly selected to be his roommate. Uh, I think that the ice was broken a little bit when he found out I was a jock. And then we started to talk a little bit and we found out that uh, there were really some things that we had in common that we liked. But Dale, when he opened up to me, he suggested to me that in Cicero, as a kid growing up, the parents would have their meetings in anticipation of Dr. Martin Luther King coming out of March. They were strategizing on how they were going to be harassing and what they were going to do or whatever. And the kids even had an assignment. Dell said they were to throw rocks and eggs and those kinds of things. They were being instructed to do that. Those are things that he shared with me and he felt open to share them at the point that our relationship became so close that when my father would come down to visit to come to a game or such like that, Dell would take him around and entertain. We became very fast friends. Uh, just a little story, but wouldn't it be great if the nation evolved in that manner? <laughs> Doc, I want to piggyback on uh, on the perspective that Mark uh, presented because when I was at the Post Tribune, um, I uh, got into a sort of running battle uh, with uh, then managing edit editor Terry O'Rourke, uh, a good guy, and and we respected each other's opinions. But um, it was my view. Uh, I took the opposite side, Mark. I, I thought that the newspaper's exposure of very, very small white supremacist group, Ku Klux Klan and others that were planning rallies gave them um, a, a sense of, of identity. They let people know about them and uh, they, they, I won't say normalized them, but they certainly made them look like um, a less than a, a fringe lunatic organization. And I know it's a debate and you can come down on either side of it and I can understand either argument, but um, the Columbia Journalism Review did a study and found out that in most studies uh, that the greater the publicity, uh, the more emboldened these organizations became. So um, I, I certainly can understand both perspectives, but I, I come down on the side of, of giving them less. In, in my view, that's how Trump became a phenomena. He had all this media coverage, legitimatized ridiculous positions, uh, covered press conferences from beginning to end and wouldn't do his opponents. And because of the sensational sensationalism, his popularity grew. What would he have been like if they had started like they ended, not covering press conferences because he knew he was going to be spreading untruths where they wouldn't even cover CNN, wouldn't even go to a press conference. If they had limited his exposure in the beginning, there may never have been a Trump administration. You know, before, when, when, does a, when does a spotlight become a stage light? That's the difference here. And I, and I understand, Mark, you're an investigative reporter, so that's your nature to put a spotlight, but it does some, seem to turn into a stage light at some point. And what Vernon said, it just blows it out somebody wouldn't even know this group or this person or this movement until now. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And it, it's a careful line that you have to walk. I mean, in the situation of the guy that I wrote about back in college, he kind of went away for a while after that. The, the spotlight wasn't on him anymore for a while after that until uh, he ended up in trial in Hammond on a special uh, relocation of trial in, in Hammond federal court. Uh, when he, he went on trial for uh, feloniously uh, attempting to kill a federal judge or hiring somebody to kill a federal judge. Uh, he has uh, since gone away to federal prison as a result of that. Um, so, you know, these are, it is a fine line, but, you know, you can look at these folks the same way I think that you can look at splinter cells of, of terrorist groups, because in some ways that's what they are. And when they're operating in the shadows and nobody knows what they're doing, I don't think that's any good for anybody either. No. Hey, Vernon, Vernon, before uh, we go into the next topic, what I would like to do is, uh, uh, you mentioned, Vernon, that some of this stuff is subtle, de facto, uh, not really visible. Uh, what I would like to do now is take the conversation to, Vernon, do you have any idea, you began the conversation in terms of uh, where should we go from here? Let's try to see if we could, uh, we may not have the answers, <laughs> But let's try to see if we can kind of uh, at least just discuss what 
possible solutions might be in order to, to make this a, a more amenable society? Well, there are two things that I would contribute to the variety of ways that we can address it. Uh, one would be uh, accountability. When people do things, they need to be exposed. They need to be called out for what they are. Um, and very candidly and very honestly and, and very truthfully. And then they need to be accountable for their actions. And then the second thing, that's reactive. Proactively, we can push for more efforts to have what's being popularly, popularly called anti-racial education and actions. Um, it's, it's one thing to, to, to look at disgust at someone doing something that you object to and shake your head and say, I'm not a part of that. And I, and I detest what he's doing. It's another thing to speak out about it and, and assume some degree of advocacy and say, not only do I not agree with it, not only do I detest it, but I'm gonna make my voice heard in opposition to it. So you know, it, it can be done at many levels, Chuck. You don't have to be a journalist. Everyday citizens can do it in everyday life and, and workplaces across the country. And if that happened in mass, we would see some change. Bernard, uh, that kind of uh, parlays into the fact that I want to mention that Greg Popovich, people wonder why he's like one of my best friends in the whole world and why he's such a voice in this and Steve Kerr and people like that. Because it's been often expressed that uh, black folks just can't always just jump up and raise our fists and raise our voices and yell that why don't we treat people right? that other folks, it, it, it needs to be a national voice and there need to be other voices, which maybe would resonate to other folks to realize that maybe we need to have a better way of doing things. Uh, Jerry, I'm gonna pick on you again, because uh, when you write about these things, uh, I see almost uh, a, a similar thing that happened with uh, Vice President Mike Pence. When you speak up for right, the right don't seem to agree with that. And you're you you, you, you you're like not kindred spirits anymore. You're not an ally. You're supposed to be hung or hang or shot or castigated. And well, you know where I'm going with that. So what are your feelings in that regard? I wish that we as society can maybe informally talk about these subjects without so much pretense and uh, bias. Like Vernon, can I meet you in an elevator and we just talk some time and we just stroll down a hallway and I can say, you know what? How does that feel when you walk down the hallway versus me? But we never do that ever. I don't want to offend you. Even if I'm ignorant about it, you don't want to broach it with me because I'm white, you're black. I'm wondering how much you and Chuck, for instance, because you're the only two black guys on right in this forum, uh, talk about race relations when you're not talking to me or in general or, or publicly. I mean, is it part of your family uh, conversation? Is, is a running string? We could talk about these things and how do you broach it? You know, it's inescapably a part of our conversation. Mm -hmm. He'll see something on Facebook or post something. I'll see something or post something. And it's not because we love it. We don't wanna talk about race. We wish there wasn't a need to talk about race. That's the whole thing. Um, Dr. King said, I don't march out here for my health. He said, I don't have a martyr complex, but until things get right, I gotta march. I gotta speak out about it. So as a columnist, and Chuck is the same, both through his um, base with the chamber and on social media, you have to constantly, I wish I didn't have to talk about race so much. I really do. When I'm thinking of what my topic is gonna be for my column, uh, the other week I wrote about baseball, cause I love baseball. And it was uh, around the time of the death of Hank Aaron. So I just wanted to go back to the days of going over to, to Comiskey Park as a child. And a couple of times I wrote about other light subjects, but I find myself drawn back into it because there are things that have to be articulated. That's so gross and impact people so broadly that to ignore it would be a dereliction of responsibility as a journalist. Hey, I, have, I have a question for you. Don't mind, Chuck. You see life through the, uh, the lens of race and color, because I do. And a lot of the younger generations say, I don't see color. I don't see Vernon, you're black. Chuck, I didn't even notice you're black. Look at that. Chuck uses black. I never knew that. That's I never 
that way. That's Mark, the worst, that. that's the that worst that thing happens? in the world is for a person to brag about being colorblind. <laughs> I don't know how people do that. And I'm always thinking, are you lying to me? Are you being honest with yourself or with me? Because I can't do it. I just can't. That's I fine. have descriptors. That's one of the descriptors. Vernon, you'd be a middle-aged black guy uh, media. That's how I would buy descriptors for you. Mark, with you middle you know middle-aged white guy it, the race always seeps into my descriptors is that common for you guys or not common well it's you know it, it, let me say this uh to Vernon's point i think that inherently we have a sense of discernment i could talk to a white person mark and and jerry and almost uh i mean it, it, it's not 100 percent accurate but almost know whether or not that person sees me as a person or see me as a black guy. And I'm saying that as the president and CEO of the chamber, yeah. I encounter that, but I have the sense of discernment. Uh, but from a business standpoint, I don't make a differentiation. I don't, I don't call anybody out or whatever, but Vernon makes a point. Silence is consent. Uh, often when I post things on Facebook, uh, I, don't try, I try not to do it regularly and, 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 and comment on everything that's said, but some things are just so egregious. It's like, you have to say something. And then a little little something in the back of my mind says, well, Chuck, you're probably gonna lose some membership <laughs> or people gonna look at you a little differently because I'll, I've raised the question in meetings before at one region and other places, to be honest with you. And uh, it kind of, you know, people look at you a little differently. And I don't know if I've suffered as a result of Vernon makes the point Silence is consent, and you almost have to say something. Let but me Mark, ask, Mark, let me ask Mark, Mark, when you're in the company of only a white group of any kind, whether it's two people or 10 or 15, someone uses the N-word in your past, possibly. How did you react to that? I mean, they're saying, don't be silent. It's, it's, a, it's a conversation you must have had, especially in your youth, because I know I did for sure. How do you address that? I mean, I've, I've always acted with disgust at the sound of that word, and, and it, it disgusts me even more now, uh, given my family situation. I, I have two children who are black. Uh, my, my daughter, my eight-year-old daughter, and my six-year-old, six just turned six yesterday, year old son, uh, are both uh, adopted into our family. Uh, birth mother met us when she was young, uh, when she was pregnant with Izzy, and we got to know her well through uh, an adoption law service. And uh, we ended up uh, adopting her. And then uh, two years later, Aiden was our version of a surprise pregnancy when he came into this world. The same, same birth mom was pregnant again, wanted to set up an adoption plan, reached out to us first. Um, you know, I, we are not colorblind and I hate when people use that word. I see that my children don't look like me. I'm not afraid to tell people that, they're, that they don't look like me and they don't carry into my genetic code. And some people would probably say that's a good thing. Um, but there's a difference between being colorblind and seeing somebody for being a human being, seeing somebody for being a human being, regardless of what they look like. Uh, and in some cases, celebrating those, those differences and the diversity. Uh, my, my youngest children are beautiful. I wouldn't want them to look any different than they do. Um, so long way around the barn on that question, Jerry, it, it, Anytime that you hear a word that disparages uh, anybody for the way they look or the genetic traits that they inherited through being born into the world, uh, and that's exactly what's happening, and that's exactly how ridiculous the whole thing is, it's, it's frankly disgusting. Mark, are you able to verbalize that or just kind of uh, body language, visual cue, you walk away? I mean, because, you know, the situation, and I don't come down preachy, but I definitely come across as I don't I'll tolerate that. I don't want to share that. I'll just bolt. But I don't get on top of the soapbox either and start preaching to people not to act a certain way. I'll be honest. I just don't do that. That's I'm telling Vernon and Chuck that that's in that situation. I'm not the one that stands up and starts bitch slapping people around. And, you know, I don't do that. I've lost friends over over those types of situations when people have said things or done things that I knew that were over, overtly racist. And frankly, there are family members that I won't talk to anymore, not necessarily in my direct family, but, uh, you know, the, the, that are related to me in, in various ways. Uh, that I just I just don't have time for anymore because of that. And because, frankly, uh, it's been heightened uh, in me even more now that I, I have children that happen to, to have that skin tone. Of course. No, my question for Vernon and Chuck is, is that enough? Is this enough for white guys like us 
to 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 counter. You said don't be silent. I mean, how much not silent should we be? I think I think that it's very critical that you speak up and 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 distance yourself from um, uh, uh, undesirable behavior and attitudes. That, that's critical. Um, I think that we then look around and see what else can I do? Because, you know, I always think like when I, they have the commercials on and you donate to one of the children's hospital because they tug at your heart or one of the homeless shelters, that's fine. You come out of your pocket, what else can you do? Can you work at a food pantry? Can you tutor some underprivileged uh, young people? Can you get involved in a blood drive? Whatever the case may be. So my answer to you, Jerry, is this. That's a good start. And okay. then look at what else you can do. Because, you know, I'm, I'm hyper. I'm, I've always been in a lot of activities, a lot of organizations, a lot of causes. So for me, um, I, I don't limit it to a single thing. I say, what can I do holistically to try to combat some of the things that we're trying to confront? 